Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and good evening. Um, Bonjour à tous. Que ce soit le matin, le midi ou l'après-midi. Bonjour à tous. Je suis Dustin Brown et je suis le directeur adjoint de of the OECD Public Governance Committee. I'm delighted to welcome you today to the launch of the first OECD survey on drivers of trust in public institutions, uh, also known as the Trust Survey. Uh, first, uh, let me uh, tell you that you can follow this event in English or French. Uh, you can use the button uh, for interpretation at the bottom of your screen. Also for the Q&A session, please send your questions in on the Zoom chat. The OECD Trust Survey is unique uh, by its depth, its scope, and its focus on unlocking progress. To start it is the first report to look beyond the surface questions on what people trust and what they don't to really understand what actually drives trust in our public institutions. Second, the survey is the first cross national stock taking of this magnitude. It interviewed over 50,000 respondents in 22 of our OECD countries. And I think it's worth noting that these 22 countries opted in to this process voluntarily, opening themselves up to scrutiny and showing leadership in government openness. This leads me to the third point, which is the report's focus on unlocking progress. Given all of the challenges we have faced over the past years and continue to face, I think it, this report comes at a really important time for OECD democracies. Public trust in government is an invaluable public good. It helps governance govern better. It fluctuates uh, trust um, uh, over time, but it provides um, a compass for governments. We in the OECD Public Governance Committee have set public trust in our government institutions as our true north to guide the variety of efforts we undertake both across countries as well as within each of our respective countries. Some degree of public skepticism, maybe even mistrust, is an important part of being a democracy. Democracies fundamentally depend on free and open engagement by citizens. We count on being held accountable and welcome it. The OECD Trust Survey is designed to be an important measurement tool that can help democratic governments understand where they're doing well and where there is room to improve and offer insights on how to make these improvements, insights that are actionable. We have an excellent set of speakers with us today. These are high level officials representing different countries of the OECD. We have Canada, Luxembourg, New Zealand, and Portugal all represented. But to start off, I would like to pass the microphone, virtual microphone, to Secretary General of the OECD, Mr. Matthias Corman, for some opening remarks through video. Dear Prime Minister Bedel, Cher uh, Xavier, distinguished guests, uh, thank you for joining today's launch of the OECD report on building trust to reinforce democracy. Uh, this report is based on the main findings of the OECD survey on the drivers of trust in public institutions. This survey is an ambitious first for the OECD. 22 OECD member countries participated in this survey to measure and better understand what drives people's trust in open democratic governments. Due to a number of cultural, social, institutional and economic factors, results do vary significantly across countries. That is why cross-national comparisons should be considered very carefully. That said, the results do show clear overall tendencies affecting OECD members everywhere. They reveal some common themes and points of attention for the future, as well as some more country-specific areas of focus. I will focus on just three of the key findings. First, a trust is strongest in relation to government reliability. 
Most citizens are confident that governments reliably deliver services such as education and health care, protect personal data, and are prepared for future pandemics. However, governments are operating in an increasingly complex and fast-paced environment with growing expectations from citizens for efficient, seamless, and user-friendly interactions with their governments. Incorporating a variety of views when designing and reforming public programs, greater testing of innovative ideas in the public sector, improving access and explanations of digital processes and the use of personal data in governance, and more systematically evaluating public service performance can help. Second, there is a need to boost trust. On average, across countries, about 4 in 10 respondents, or 41.4%, said they trust their national government, but that average conceals a wide variation among countries. The share of people who trust their government reaches over 60% of the population in places like Finland and Norway. However, in about a quarter of the countries surveyed, that share drops to below 30%. It is worth noting that on average across countries, 4 in 10 respondents, 41.1%, do not trust their government. So trust and distrust are evenly split. There's also a high degree of neutrality in some countries. 14.8% of respondents on average across countries hold a neutral position, neither trusting nor distrusting their government, and about 3% report that they don't know. Clearly, there is room for improvement in how governments operate on a daily basis, respond to crises, and address structural challenges and disruptions, which will in turn strengthen public trust. Third, too few citizens feel that they have a voice in key decisions, and the integrity of public officials is in doubt. Young people, women, people on lower incomes and those less educated are less likely to trust their government and are skeptical that their government listens to them. Governments must recommit to inclusive governance, which considers and addresses diverse perspectives in policy design and implementation. This may require reform to increase the representation of different views. Understanding key differences and drivers across population groups can help governments to better target and inform public policies. In closing, trust in government matters, of course. To meet people's evolving expectations, OECD governments need to invest in improving the mechanisms through which they give all people a voice and are responsive to those voices. They will also <clears throat> need to bolster integrity and fight undue influence, address increasingly pressing long-term structural challenges such as climate change, communicate the effects of reforms on different socio-economic groups, develop better governance models for information ecosystems, and regularly monitor public trust in institutions. A lot of food for thought. Much we can do. Best wishes for positive and productive discussions today. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General, for your remarks and your leadership on this important issue. Indeed, I think we can all agree that in the current environment, it is more important than ever that we strengthen trust to help democratic governments respond to crises and address structural challenges and disruptions. I'd like to now share a video uh, from the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Mr. Xavier Bettel, through video. I also take this occasion to thank Luxembourg, which will be chairing the upcoming OECD ministerial meeting of the Public Governance Committee on building trust and reinforcing democracy this coming November. Monsieur le secrétaire général, cher Mathias, mesdames et messieurs les délégués, je suis heureux de pouvoir vous adresser ces quelques mots. I'm very happy to say these few words with, at the occasion of the launch of the Trust in Government report. 
For a long time, trust in public institutions appear to be evident in our democratic system. Very recently, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the exceptional measures restricting the civil liberties that were taken in many countries, um, been bluntly reminded that uh, citizens' trust towards uh, decision makers and the system is vital to guarantee uh, the functioning of our democratic societies. If the majority of citizens, citizens trusted decision makers and believed and followed the decisions taken by them, there were violent and irrational reactions of a tiny fraction of our citizens, those citizens who lost trust in their political decision and politicians and decision makers. This gave us a glimpse of what it means to lose the trust of our citizens. People can, of course, choose not to trust the choices made by their politicians, but the lack of trust in politicians persists in the long term. If that happens, the risk is that it will call into question the institutions themselves, their legitimacy and the functioning of our democracy. Trust is essential for the functioning of our democracies. Unfortunately, even in countries which have a very long uh, democratic tra tradition, we are seeing an erosion of trust in public institutions. And this erosion of trust should alert us. It cannot, rem it cannot remain uh, um, sensitive to that. We have to take into account the democratic expectations of our citizens and listen to how they perceive our decisions. Citizens must be made to feel that their positions, their opinions, their fears are taken into account in the way we shape our political responses. We need to think out of the box, especially in order to face the deep challenges that we're going to have to find new forms of uh, public, partici public participation and uh, decision making for citizens. This is why I have established a, a bureau for citizens in which a representative sample of 100 citizens voiced their opinion on Luxembourg's current fight uh, against climate change and who are invited to make proposals in order to generate new ideas. This is not top, bottom, top down, it's a bottom up approach. These proposals will eventually be presented and debated in Parliament. I'm convinced that this experiment in public participation will continue to reinforce the belief that our political systems are still capable to provide the necessary solutions. If not, it will be very difficult to face as a democracy the daunting challenges that lie ahead of us, especially climate change. Trust is also about assurance. Having faith in the future, ladies and gentlemen, in order to be, have that assurance, we need to adapt our democratic model. It's more than ever necessary to understand the drivers of trust. Without this understanding, we will not be able to determine the most effective levers to restore trust in institutions and reinforce people's participation in the democratic process. We're seeing this with the level of abstention in past elections. We need to close the gap between the horizon of decision makers, often linked to the electoral process, and leads to prioritization with short-term impacts and the challenge of the society that are generally much more medium-term or long-term. Political decision makers need to think about how we choose and to explain our choices. Citizens' trust is essential, and this, this is the price for that trust. For that reason, ladies and gentlemen, we need to rebuild and reinforce our citizens' confidence in their government's ability to master these intergenerational and global challenges. I'd like to thank OECD for the conceptual and concrete work uh, it's done to rebuild trust and reinforce our democracy. The trust survey will give us a precious tool to help better understand the drives, what drives public confidence in institutions and to close trust gaps, as we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic. It will also enable us to monitor progress. Trust in government has to be a key component in how we assess performance. In our particular case, the trust survey shows that preserving and strengthening the trust capital is essential. Make sure our institutions deliver policies that improve people's lives and are fit to address future trade-offs and challenges.
la démocratie possède cette capacité de fournir à la société une méthode de résolution des conflits pacifiques, car elle accepte et elle encourage la diversité. Uh, in this logic that is enshrined in democracy's very DNA. Democracy is a fragile yet precious good that we need to preserve so that future generations can also thrive in a peaceful society. And that is the very basis of Luxembourg's commitment to strengthening trust in democratic institutions. So we are delighted to be hosting the OECD Public Governance Ministerial Meeting on the 17th and 18th of November on the theme Building Trust and Reinforming reinforcing democracy to discuss actions to rebuild trust in public institutions and on tackling the key public governance challenges to democracy. This meeting will be the ideal forum, I'm convinced of it, to identify essential courses of action and reinforce trust in our democratic institutions and thus tackle the challenges lying ahead for our democratic societies. Prime Minister, thank you uh, for sharing this message with us. I think I speak on behalf of the whole Public Governance Committee when I say that we are very much looking forward to the upcoming ministerial on building trust and reinforcing democracy. It will be an excellent opportunity for OECD ministers and other stakeholders to explore in more detail how to strengthen trust in public institutions and tackle the key public governance challenges to democracy. As the prime minister said so rightly, trust in democracy is a fragile but precious good that we must work together to preserve for today and future generations. And there is much we can learn from each other on that front. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the director of the Public Governance Committee at the OECD, Ms. Elsa Pilichowski, who will present the key findings of the report. I know from my many meetings with Elsa and her team that this topic is a real priority of hers, and it's an integral part of OECD's new Reinforcing Democracy initiative. Elsa is going to give us an overview of the presentation of the Trust Survey Report. So Elsa, let's dig in. Merci beaucoup, Dustin. Je vais commencer uh, en français, continuerai en anglais. Merci French, and then I'll continue in English. Thank you very much to the Prime Minister of Luxembourg and to the Secretary General of the OECD for having opened this launch conference. Thank you also to our panelists and thank you to members of the Public Governance Committee and to all member states uh, who helped us launch and implement this project. And thank you also to the advisory group for the technical engagement uh, throughout the past year. Uh, this survey took a lot of work. It is the result of 10 years of debates uh, among members uh, prior to the launch of the, the survey on, on trust in institutions and 22 countries participated. Now for the majority of uh, countries, the survey was run uh, some, anywhere between a year and a half and two years after the beginning of the pandemic and between before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So between November 2021 and February 2022. Um, however, in Finland and Norway, the survey was run uh, prior to this period and for other countries uh, which responded to the survey in March 2022. Now the results vary considerably because of various cultural, social, institutional and economic uh, factors, but there's also the specific context of the country at the time when the survey was run. And as the Secretary General was saying, comparisons need to be made cautiously, um, particularly because in some countries, the proportion of people responding that they're neutral or that they do not know is relatively high. However, there are clear general tendencies and common issues uh, to various countries, uh, as well as specific concerns in each country. On average across countries, there is an even split between the share of people who trust their national government and those who do not. About four in 10 trust their government and about four in 10 do not trust their government. 18 months, almost two years after the beginning of the health, social and economic crisis due to the COVID pandemic, Trust is under strain, we can say it, but remains slightly higher on average than in the aftermath of the financial crisis. 
As expected, the survey reveals, of course, large variations across countries with trust levels above 60% in Finland and Norway, and trust levels below 30% in countries such as uh, Austria, Colombia, France, Japan, and Latvia. Although the timing issue and the percentage of don't knows are also likely to be important factors. At the more granular level, when we unpack the data that you have in front of you, the judiciary, pol the police, the civil service and local governments tend to inspire more confidence than national governments, elected officials, political parties and parliament. Next slide, please. The first important message of the survey on the drivers of trust is that on average, citizens in these countries are reasonably confident that they can rely on governments to deliver public services. The majority says they are satisfied with the healthcare and educational systems, and satisfaction with administrative services is even higher at 63% for all on average across countries. I think we can say that this is a remarkable finding considering that the survey was conducted almost two years into the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. In the, same, in the same vein, and very importantly, given the timing, almost uh, half of respondents say that their governments would be prepared for future pandemics, while only one third says that their governments would not be ready uh, for uh, future pandemics, again, with large country differences. We also have many other measures of reliability that confirm the overall reasonable confidence of citizens in the fact that their, their governments are reliable. The majority of people in most countries are satisfied with access to information about administrative procedures and also they trust their government to use their personal data only for legitimate purposes and finally about six in ten respondents think they would be treated fairly if they, if they applied for benefit so um, and further analysis shows that these different measures of government reliability are a key driver of the levels of public trust next slide please so what are the drivers that explain why trust levels are not entirely satisfactory today? Um, what is coming up clearly from the survey are factors that are related to participation, representation, and responsiveness. What you are seeing on this slide is the discrepancy between the fact that half of the respondents think that government should prioritize actions related to climate change, while in fact only a third think their country would be able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we have also other results in the survey that shows a correlation between trust in government and confidence that their country will succeed in reducing emissions. All this is pretty tangible evidence that people want their government to be more forward thinking, more action oriented, and they also lack the confidence that government will deliver on this. Next slide, please. This slide shows another example showing the discrepancy between citizens' growing expectations and their perception of government responsiveness. Only a minority of respondents, about 40%, believes that a poor public service would be improved if people complained about it. Differences across countries are smaller than other measures of, uh, for the drivers of trust, with only Korea having more than 50% of respondents having confidence that the public service would be improved. Similar results on average are found on people's confidence that their government would implement an innovative idea or, or change a national policy in response to public demands. Next slide, please. On measures of citizen participation, only one in three citizens considers that their government lets them have a say in government decision-making. And the statistical work shows that this is one of the factors, if not the factor, which is likely to have the most significant impact on trust in national government today on average across countries. Next slide, please. Results on perception of government integrity show that it is an issue with almost half of respondents thinking that a high level political official would grant a political favor in exchange for the offer of a well-paid private sector job this is another area where differences across countries are relatively small. Uh, moreover, more than one third, 35.7%, believe that a public employee would accept money in exchange for speeding up access to a public service. Next slide, please. 
Our survey is also allowing us to disaggregate data by population groups. And not surprisingly, uh, we have found that disadvantaged groups with less, whether it's real or perceived, uh, access to opportunity and voice have lower levels of trust in government. For instance, this figure shows that respondents with personal financial concerns have considerably lower trust in government across all surveyed countries relative to people who are financially more stable. Next slide, please. We also find that younger people on this slide or people with uh, lower levels of education or women are less likely to trust their national government. All these gaps may reflect, of course, the negative impact that wider societal inequalities are having on public trust and the role of inequalities in fueling partisanship and polarization. Next slide, please. Obviously, we have only shown a few of the striking results of the survey and much more detailed analysis is available in the report. And in the same manner, we will continue to analyze the data more in depth in the months to come. But what are the key takeaways for government? First, connecting and engaging better with citizens in policy design, in delivery and reform, enhancing political voice, continuously improving public services based on citizens' feedback, ensuring the inclusion of vulnerable groups, all of this will have a positive effect on trust. But of course, this will require institutional investment in dialogue and communication. Second, we have seen that expectations on the integrity of elected and non-elected officials are higher than their perceived levels of integrity. It will be necessary to review the how, the how of public integrity and raising the bar for elected and non-elected officials. Third, while measures of government reliability are reasonably satisfactory, we've shown that at the beginning of the presentation, Data also shows that this continues to be an important driver of trust and all efforts should continue to be made to continuously improve services, be prepared for future crises and improve government transparency. Let me close by saying that this survey on trust is an important tool in itself for governments to continuously improve by listening uh, to their citizens. We will also collectively learn from this survey and improve it in the future. And also, we do it on a regular basis with uh, our members. Once again, I would like to thank the many government officials who have championed this exercise by taking and working on the survey, as well as our chair, Dustin Brown, and the, the PGC Bureau as a whole for their support throughout. And a final word for the team under the leadership of Monica Brezzi, who have worked tirelessly over the past year to make it happen. And I would like to thank them very much for their really groundbreaking work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elsa, and I would like to echo the congratulations uh, to your team, including Monica and her group who have been at this uh, for quite some time that put us in a position to be able to take this next big step. Um, that foundational work has been critical to where we are today. So uh, really uh, appreciate uh, your remarks and the, the team's work. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists uh, for discussion. Um, we have Ms. Carolyn Bilkey, who since April is the New Zealand ambassador to the OECD. We have Mr. Dominic LeBlanc, Minister of the Intergovernmental Affairs, Infrastructure and Communities in Canada. And Ms. Mariana Vieira da Silva, Minister of the Presidency in Portugal. I'd invite those who are listening to the panel to ask questions in the chat function as there will be time for Q&A session at the end. So, Let's uh, go ahead and uh, turn to the panelists to get their perspectives on the implications of these findings. And uh, let me begin with Minister LeBlanc uh, to offer uh, some thoughts on why uh, this survey is important for Canada to measure trust in institutions at this juncture and what he sees as the key learnings from the trust survey for Canada in the context of the common agenda on reinforcing democracy. Minister. I think you're muted. There you go. Great. Those, those famous words from the last two and a <laughs> half years, Dustin. Uh, so thank you very much for including me 
uh, in this conversation, et je voudrais évidemment uh, m'associer uh, aux mots du secrétaire général de son excellence. The secretary aussi. general, um, his excellency, the prime minister of Luxembourg as well. Uh, I too, and the government of Canada uh, also um, fully agrees with the, their statements. And I'd also like to thank uh, Elsa for presenting the conclusions of this document. The Canadian government finds this report absolutely fascinating, reassuring in some ways, worrying in others. And for that, I am extremely grateful and very, very, very happy to be a part of this conversation this morning. And I'm speaking from the east coast of Canada. Uh, it's early here today, and I'd like uh, to say hello to my our friends in Europe and across the world who are here today. Us, Prime Minister Trudeau said at a summit for democracy in December that governments must work to ensure that people in all of their diversity, including marginalized people, can make their voices heard. Ensuring that we can hear the voices of all our citizens uh, is a fundamental part of what makes governance democratic. Uh, so it's important for our government, it's important for partner governments, obviously, at the OECD that participated in this important survey. Uh, the efforts to include citizens, all citizens, uh, in delivering government services and in developing the policies that lead to the best government services um, is one of the critical takeaways for our government from this survey. Uh, we were very pleased as a government that the OECD uh, decided to examine this issue in such a substantive and significant way. Uh, and it also provides, I think, all of us a roadmap of some practical solutions to how we can reinforce uh, and, uh, and improve trust in basic democratic and public institutions. I, it's no secret we took that, Dustin, from the survey. It's true in Canada, but it's true in partner countries, as we saw. Democracy and our institutions are facing growing threats, growing threats from actors who are seeking uh, to deliberately and in a malevolent way weaken public confidence in institutions. We think one of the biggest threats uh, to our collective faith in democratic institutions uh, is the use of disinformation uh, to deliberately undermine and hinder governments in the, in the plural sense ability to pursue core public policy objectives that benefit uh, citizens of the democratic country. The OECD evidence that we saw in the report uh, clearly says that uh, people who feel uh, a lack of their, of their voice, of their political voice, are more likely to exit the democratic process, behave cynically, uh, engage. And this, as Elsa said, is a small, small group of people, uh, but nonetheless, for us, a, a worrisome trend. Uh, these people are likely to engage in forms of participation that may be outside a basic democratic system, such as boycotts, or even in some very rare cases, acts of violence. So we think that trust uh, is linked to outcomes uh, such as a social cohesion, a common sense of purpose. That for us is one of the best ways to increase uh, confidence in public policy measures and the functioning of our institutions. We've taken some comfort that Canada in some respects in the survey uh, is doing some things right. Uh, we do obviously take note uh, and want to work with partner countries on ways that we can improve some of these measures of public confidence in government. And finally, Dustin, one of the challenges for us as a country, and I'm sure it's shared from around the world, we just need to look at some of the challenges at our global airports around the world, our collective ability to deliver core public services to people. In Canada, it's renewing passports, uh, it's processing immigration cases, uh, or immigration applications, visas, uh, some of the challenges at some of Canada's big airports around security screening, 
uh, border services agencies. These core public services that Canadians and taxpayers around the world are funding uh, have been greatly affected by COVID uh, and our ability to return to a pre-pandemic level of basic service to Canadians in these very visible ways is a big challenge in our country. My boss, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, has set up a group of ministers in our government to focus specifically this summer urgently on what internal processes Canada can improve quickly. Uh, because if there's a cynical view of some public services and people are waiting overnight in front of a passport office in Canada uh, to get a passport to travel uh, perhaps to, uh, to Paris, to the headquarters of the OECD, uh, you can see why they're frustrated and understandably angry. Uh, so this is for us a, a, an immediate, simple challenge in some respects, but complicated in others, because it feeds the sense that perhaps uh, democratic governments aren't up to the task of providing these basic services. And that's obviously something that all governments, including my own, will want to address quickly. So those are some opening comments, Dustin, but I look forward to hearing the other panelists. And I appreciate very much your kind invitation. Well, thank you uh, for starting us off uh, with those uh, insights and reflections. The comments you made certainly resonate with the discussions we've been having in OECD, the connection between service quality and people's trust in government, the implications of those negative experiences and how much those matter in people's views as well, um, not just the, the, the positive ones. And um, I think there is a lot we, we can learn there and um, it's certainly gonna be a focus, I think, for our future work across the committee. I wanted to follow up on one um, point you made about mis and disinformation and um, any additional um, uh, thoughts you might have on, on steps uh, Canada has taken uh, as that relates uh, to this overall um, effort around strengthening democracy and improving trust. So uh, Dustin, uh, thank you again. And I think uh, all of us uh, have at various times seen the uh, very corrosive influence of disinformation in a moment where uh, social media platforms have such enormous impact. Uh, and they too, by the way, have a responsibility to work with democratic governments uh, around uh, a way to manage disinformation. It's not good enough anymore simply to flag something. Uh, I think we all collectively need to reflect, uh, and certainly we're doing that in our country, on the responsibility of these hugely powerful transnational corporations in terms of fighting disinformation. From our perspective, Dustin, in Canada, one of the things that we have tried to do is enhance citizen resilience. Uh, as the survey shows, a group of politicians talking about disinformation perhaps isn't the most credible way for citizens to understand its corrosive influence, the deliberate nature by which people seek to undermine or damage public confidence. So one of the things we've done, and, and responding to disinformation campaigns, uh, obviously engages necessarily basic democratic principles like freedom of speech, uh, and other democratic rights. So that's why it's a complicated space uh, to discuss uh, or to take action in. And democratic governments and OECD partner countries uh, are all struggling with this, including my own country, and look to each other for best practices. But one of the things that Canada has found is civil society, citizen groups, academic institutions, uh, journalists, NGOs, uh, have often been amongst the best voices in building up citizen resilience and understanding to disinformation. It obviously takes a free and independent media to report on what's going on in any democratic country, to hold governments to account, but also to uncover stories that matter to us and those perhaps that are fueled by uh, this global uh, scourge of, of, of disinformation. So we as a government have tried to fund and it's they're small investments if you look at the overall pattern of government spending, uh, certainly in recent years, uh, but we've tried to fund 
uh, civil society groups, academic institutions, other thought leaders, separate and independent from government, with enormous credibility, we think, in the Canadian public discourse. We've tried to fund these organizations to ramp up their ability uh, to inform citizens of uh, disinformation attempts, but to build up a resilience to direct citizens uh, to more reliable sources of information and to call out uh, actors and specific examples of disinformation. We think that governments have a role to play for sure, uh, but we also look to groups like the OECD, but civil society groups in Canada who can really help us uh, build up, we think, a much better defensive posture uh, to what is a, a very corrosive and, and a trend line that's worrisome uh, in terms of, uh, of our democratic institutions. Yeah, very important points. And the, and the how uh, of all of that is so critical. And um, I do think there are a lot of lessons we can learn across again in that area. Thank you for those um, uh, comments. And, and we'll um, uh, next turn to Minister Mariana Vieira da Silva of Portugal um, uh, to hear from her on uh, kind of what key aspects for an agenda on building trust and reinforcing democracy are of top of mind in Portugal and in particular, uh, how the survey results uh, can support uh, this agenda. Over to you, Mariana. Thank you, thank you very much, Dustin. I'd like to start by thank you for the invitation to participate in this session and by highlighting the fact that Portugal is one of the first member states to participate in this comparative study. And of course, I would like to congratulate OECD and Elsa and her team for this study. In these times, it is particularly important to reflect and discuss public governance and the level of trust in our institutions and in democracy. With this study being one more available tool to access the national situation. In fact, 2022 marks the moment in which the days Portugal has lived in democracy surpass the number of days Portugal had lived in a dictatorship. It is a particular moment of reflection which serves to remind us how far we still have to go to defend and improve our democracy, to guarantee the proper functioning of our public institu institutions and the trust of our citizens. But answering the question, the first point I would like to highlight concerns the importance of living conditions and shared prosperity to build trust in public, public institutions. The study demonstrates that in all countries, people with better socioeconomic outcomes tend to trust government institutions more. And this relationship is also observed from a historical perspective. Based on Eurobarometer data, the percentage of respondents who tend to trust the government have more than doubled since the period of crisis that Portugal went through at the beginning of the last decade. These figures demonstrate that building trust in public institutions is not independent of social cohesion. When people feel that policies work for them and for the improvement of their living conditions, trust in institution increases. And that means policies must work for the many and that, that many, that majority must be engaged in the process. This factor is all, also observed in the extent to which Portuguese people recognize the responsiveness and real reliability of um, our public health and education services. In fact, these services register confidence levels above OECD average. The second point of the study that I would like to underline concerns the importance of ensuring transparency of policies and services provided as a key factor to build trust and increase the participation of civil society. Recognizing the merits of this practice, I would like to draw attention to the following recent developments in Portugal. Online publication of data and service performance indicators in key areas such as health and justice. The transparency portal, which makes all information on the allocation of public resources, namely European funds, more accessible to any citizen. And open data portal, which uh, with the provision of administrative databases that 
allow researcher, researchers and entity and entities to contribute to the expansion of knowledge base regarding of the provision of public policies and services. A third point I'd like to uh, highlight concerns the growing importance not only of properly considering policy measures, inserting them into coherent actions, but also of evaluating their results. The study that had a special section of the importance of science in the public policy decision-making pro process in Portugal demonstrates that public policies require decision, discussion, sharing of ideas and knowledge of reality. Let's think about the experience we all had of deciding in times of a pandemic. Times that have shown the challenges of uncertainty like few others. Times that came to show also to the public how working with the scientific community information and knowledge are fundamental, not only for the decision process, but for the democratic process itself. Uh, I have defended in other forums, I believe that the responsiveness and the eff effectiveness of public policies with concrete result in people, people's lives can only be maximized if we are able to bring together the available information and knowledge that allow us to know the problem, study the solutions, make choices, implement policies, and then evaluate them. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Minister. I, I'd love to follow up and just maybe any more details you're able to share on specific um, initiatives um, or reforms that your government intends to implement, especially around reconnecting with citizens and reinforcing the importance of knowledge in the public policy and decision-making process within Portugal. Of course, Dustin. I would like to highlight the creation last year in the presidency of the Council of Ministers, uh, which I'm responsible uh, of, um, the creation of the in the center of the government of uh, the first competence center for planning policies and prospective pr perspective of public administration. This decision was based precisely on the vision that the definition of a strategic lines of decision and the evaluation of public policies always depend on relevant, current and reliable information that enhances knowledge and allows accessing the dimension, the importance and the interconnections between different activities uh, and realities. The establishment of this center will allow uh, monitoring and strengthening each of the stages of the intervention in terms of public policies, planning, designing, implement, implementing, monitoring and reviewing, creating the methodologies that um, and internal competence that are necessary for uh, responsive and reliable public policies and services. It is intended that this service brings together skills for planning and designing innovative public policies, ex ante and also ex post impact assessment, monitoring and review of public policies, guaranteeing the participation of stakeholders we, who are the final recipients of uh, public policies. It's also an intent that this center constitutes the engine of a network of knowledge sharing intersectoral cooperation in the, air, in the area of strategic planning, which allows in, particu in particular the sharing of good practices and the development of uh, uh, collaborative work. I believe that sharing of experiences, the dialogue between society, universities, public administration and government can effectively, effectively allow us to better decide on which challenges we want to respond and uh, which instruments we selected to address uh, uh, those challenges. And I think that became very clear here today, the sharing and discussion of ideas is a fundamental moment of the for the construction of solutions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mariana. As you can see, um, uh, one of the real advantages we have is different countries trying different approaches and then coming back and being really honest about what's worked, what hasn't, uh, so that we can continue to grow kind of the learning that's so critical here across each of our respective countries. Uh, let me uh, now uh, uh, bring in uh, Ambassador Bilkey uh, for the final questions before we turn to the chat. And, and please do keep your questions coming in on the chat. 
Uh, New Zealand, I think it's fair to say, is a high trust uh, democracy, meaning that it really does benefit from uh, relatively elevated levels of trust in government and public institutions. And we have seen it put uh, confidence in public institutions and each other at the core of its approach to the COVID-19 pandemic in particular. Uh, I would love to hear more about any learnings from the results of the trust survey uh, for New Zealand as it embarks on developing an inclusive recovery with a strong trust between citizens and government. So uh, over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Dustin, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the viewers. I saw some people from Africa have beamed in, which is fantastic. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the previous speakers, uh, the Secretary General and the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, as well as my distinguished fellow pan panelists. Um, and just to add my congratulations to Elsa, to Elsa, to you and your team for on um, the launch of this survey. Um, I think the Prime Minister of Luxembourg referred to it as a precious tool, and it certainly uh, is from New Zealand's perspective because you know we uh, we place significant emphasis on trust, both because it's necessary for the legitimacy of public institutions and the functioning uh, of a democratic government, but also because it's so important when we need uh, people to behave in a certain way, um, such as in a health, public health response uh, in the situation of COVID-19, which we've all just uh, been through. Um, and yes, the survey does show that we have uh, relatively high trust in government here in New Zealand and in our public institutions, um, and that people see uh, the government is reliable in providing services and protecting citizens. And the survey confirms um, uh, our own domestic trust survey. So our Public Service Commission to check in on, on public views on this uh, does a regular survey. And um, it's pleasing to see that uh, trust in our public institutions remains higher now than pre-pandemic uh, levels. 62% of respondents said they trust the public sector brand. 81% said they trusted the services based on their recent experience. And that's uh, a long-term upward trend that um, we've observed. Now, in response to your question, yes, definitely there are lessons for us in these results. Um, the findings, uh, it's interesting, the findings are quite common across um, many of the OECD members. And the results for us highlight the transformations that we need to take to strengthen our democracy further. And particular areas for us are creating opportunities for meaningful engagement with the public. Um, public participation, as has been mentioned, is extremely important. And one recent area that we're focusing on is strengthening engagement with ethnic communities in response to the Royal Commission of Inquiry uh, into the Christchurch terrorist attacks in 2019. And the aim of, of this um, strengthened engagement is to ensure that these communities have a stronger voice in the design of the policies and programs that affect them. We also uh, want to improve on listening to citizens, responding to feedback, because our research shows the most important driver um, is the experience that people have of the services we deliver. So we want them to be more reliable, more responsive. Perceptions of integrity of public servants is also another area that we're looking at closely. Trust is built on how we behave. And of course, I'm a public servant too. Um, our integrity, our motivation is a key driver of trust. And we have public sector, uh, service principles of political neutrality, free and frank advice, merit-based appointments, open government and stewardship. And these are all aspects of why the public has confidence in public servants. We want to maintain our reputation as one of the least corrupt countries in the world, but that needs continual work. At the moment, we're, um, I think, in 2021, we were first equal in the Transparency International Corruption per Perceptions Index. So we need to maintain that. Um, and we're also looking at addressing uh, differences in trust across population groups. And uh, this has already been mentioned as well. But trust isn't just about an individual's experience, but also how their social network, their wider community experience, um, their interaction with government. and. Māori, the New Zealand, the Indigenous people of New Zealand, um, we found that they tend to have lower trust 
um, as measured in our own survey, whereas New Zealand European and Asian respondents have higher trust. So why is that? What can we do to address that? Um, so there's a lot of work still to do. We start from a strong position, but research shows us that trust is hard to gain and easy to lose. So nurturing trust and confidence in our public institutions requires constant improvement and attention. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your, your point too about being able to look at various um, breakouts within our own countries to spot uh, variations that might exist. I think it's not just kind of looking across our, our different countries at an aggregate level, but really being able to dig in to understand uh, how different populations and subgroups uh, uh, will might be responding differently uh, or in I think that's absolutely critical and, and probably part of the work that is to come as we dive in um, in even greater detail. Uh, could I just follow up uh, with a question? Uh, given um, your uh, perspective uh, as the New Zealand ambassador to the OECD, you obviously cover quite a broad range of issues. Um, could you maybe just say a, a words as we look into the future, um, how you see this work around building trust and reinforcing democracy within the broader set of, of OECD uh, priorities uh, in, in the years to come? Sure. Well, I mean, it's clear, isn't it, that um, the global, that there's a need for global partnership on the global issues that we face, climate change, mis and disinformation that others have spoken about, the fight against terrorism. And of course, as we've all been through uh, very recently, preparation for pandemics. And they're very complex issues. Uh, there are certainly opportunities for us to learn from one another. So um, from my perspective, sitting here in Paris, you know, the fact that the OECD is emphasizing these through that uh, reinforcing democracy initiative is really important. And as a permanent rep, my role is to ensure that the valuable work being done in the OECD is, is considered, taken into account in Wellington, and um, that we maintain that feedback loop, which is absolutely crucial for the people who are working on these issues on the ground. Um, the priorities in the initiative are absolutely crucial, um, both to addressing some of the common areas needed to strengthen trust that have been raised and to safeguard democracy more broadly. And um, you know, these uh, objectives are becoming more and more important in this time of increasing threats to democracy. Um, and you know, it's vital for OECD countries to strengthen the factors that build and maintain trust and reinforce um, democracy. And you spoke to that yourself, um, Dustin. So public participation in government, addressing climate change are, are important priorities for us too, because national action on globally significant issues such as climate change is another driver, a critical driver of public trust. So it's also an area where you know, we need to see behavioral change. New Zealand governments recently um, released an emissions reduction plan for the economy to achieve legislated emission reduction targets. And so a participatory approach is absolutely necessary to maintain the trust as we go through uh, this process to, to net carbon zero, um, because there's gonna be a lot of trade-offs involved and so we need that trust to make sure that we uh, maintain a, an effective response. Misinformation, can I, the Minister LeBlanc talked about that. Um, mis and disinformation, impacts of digital technology on public governance are also big priorities. Um, you know, they have uh, the potential to significantly undermine trust. And we saw this recently in New Zealand. We had a prolonged protest and occupation of our parliament grounds. And it was about um, people opposed to vaccine, vaccine mandates. And a lot of them were driven at least in part by mis and, and disinformation regarding COVID-19. Um, in terms of responding to terrorism and the weaponizing of social media to further terrorist aims, we have uh, New Zealand together with France is leading on the Christchurch call, um, which is about addressing terrorist and violent extremist content online. And Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has emphasized this, um, this mechanism as, um, as a multi, a values-based, multi-stakeholder, multi-disciplinary approach, which involves governments, but also the tech sector, and civil society, um, you know, to try and, and clamp down on, on 
um, terrorism and extremist content online. So those are a few of the areas that mm -hmm. we are prioritizing. Thank you. No, uh, thank you. And I think that's um, one of the things we are realizing is just how critical the centers of our government really are going to be in this, um, in large part because of their convening role. Uh, across all of those different groups, uh, both within government, but as well as outside stakeholders that really do have to be engaged in this effort. And uh, that is one of the things that, that I think most of us look to the center of governments for is, is really being able to convene and bring all of the right parties together. Uh, well, I really appreciate uh, all of the remarks uh, from the, the panelists. And, and um, I also really appreciate you keeping us um, on schedule, which allows us some time to um, uh, uh, take a couple of questions that we have received from uh, uh, the, the actually very uh, strong uh, number of people who have joined us today. I think I'm seeing over 400 and it's staying strong, which is wonderful to see. Um, so the first question uh, we have is from Tiago Santos um, and I'll just open it up to whoever wants to, to respond to this first, but welcome any and all of you to react. Um, there appears to be an excessive intergenerational gap in trust with people aged 50 or older trusting much more than younger cohorts. Can this be read as a commentary on intergenerational fairness? Um, and how can governments build uh, more confidence among young people? Would anyone like to um, take that? But D Dustin. I, oh. Uh, Mariana, so go, go ahead, Mariana, LZ, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question. We have in Portugal a very low rate of participation in the political process of the younger, uh, of the younger people. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I think this also relates to the, to the problem that uh, Tiago um, uh, assumes. Um, I think we have uh, one problem related to the issues uh, that we are ad addressing in our uh, political uh, debates. Uh, most of them uh, are issues that probably younger people cannot relate to. But of course, we now have, uh, with the uh, climate transition and digital tr transition, a strong opportunity to find new ways of involving uh, younger people in the discussion and uh, uh, taking the examples I gave in my previous intervention. Um, I think we need uh, to have policies that work for younger people, but because that's one of the most important things we have to ensure uh, and uh, guarantee that they trust uh, government uh, more. And I think we have a strong op opportunity of doing so uh, because when we talk, for instance, about uh, climate action, they are the ones that are um, on the streets um, saying that we need to care about uh, our planet. And uh, I think that's a, a very good opportunity to um, uh, address this issue, which, which is very important. Younger people vote less, trust less, and participate less in our uh, political process. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Minister LeBlanc. So, I, I, Dustin, I, I think the question is inspired by a, a thoughtful analysis. I agree it's interesting that the democratic context in Portugal that Mariana described is very similar uh, to ours on the other side of the ocean uh, in Canada. I agree with her entirely that the ability of democratic governments to talk about issues that matter to younger people is the first step uh, to encouraging them to remain or get engaged in the democratic process. The obvious one, as Mariana noted, is climate change, climate action. Uh, Caroline also referred to the emissions reduction plan in New Zealand. We are going through the same process here in Canada. So the more governments talk about issues that resonate with younger people, the more they'll feel connected to those uh, processes. It's sort of a vicious circle because as fewer younger people participate in voting, necessarily political discourse migrates to the issues that an older population may be interested in. Um, and you can think of things like healthcare, long-term care, critical issues for democratic countries. 
but somebody who's 24 years old may not be as focused on the waiting list to get an orthopedic procedure as might be their grandparents. Um, so go governments need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, focus on issues that matter to a broad spectrum of people, particularly younger people. Um, the other, and we see the same thing, by the way, if it's true with younger voters or participants in democratic countries, it's also true um, with respect to marginalized people. Uh, I'm glad that Caroline referred to indigenous people in New Zealand, same context again, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean in Canada. Um, so there are many commonalities. The final thing, Dustin, is governments need to talk to younger people to answer the specific question uh, in places that they are, and they're online. Uh, younger people don't get their information or participate in conversations the way their parents and grandparents do. I represent a rural constituency on the East Coast of Canada. If we have a public meeting on a particular issue, uh, the, and I'm 54 years old, the average age of the people coming to that meeting will be considerably higher uh, than my own age. Uh, I'll be the youngest person at many of those meetings. Uh, but if you do something online, if you do something that's accessible uh, to younger people virtually and on digital platforms, uh, you'll hear their voices uh, and you'll, you'll get input and participation that you won't get in a more traditional way that perhaps we've practiced politics one or two generations ago. No, I think that's uh, exactly right. Uh, it used to be that we think, oh, well, we'll develop this website and allow people to get services that way. And now the expectation is that if you can't do it on your phone, you're, you're way behind the times, right? So this is a rapidly evolving kind of set of expectations that people have based on their experience with the private sector and in other parts of their lives that we definitely need to keep up with. Um, uh, Ambassador Book, anything on this point? Uh, otherwise, we can turn to uh, an, an additional question in the chat. Keep moving. Okay. Uh, so an additional one we received um, was uh, from a professor in Belgium. Um, and um, the, the question is, given that uh, current and future reliability of core public services is a crucial basis to main trust, how can government so it, governments ensure that this reliability of public services in terms of provision and quality in light of the disruptions coming from global crises like climate change, I'd also put supply chain probably in there, which I know many of us are experiencing, and coming from disruptive technology changes which call from, for continuous radical innovations with respect of our public services. So anyone would like to um, uh, jump in on, on that point and question. Dustin, I'll go quickly and maybe the ambassador or others want to add something. I think the professor is absolutely right. And I, I referred to it, I think, briefly in my opening comments. The ability for democratic governments to provide basic public services that their citizens, their taxpayers, those that are paying for those services, the ability to provide efficiently and accessibly those services is critical. You referred, Dustin, in your wrap-up on the previous question to the importance of technology and, and, and digital platforms. But in a, in a country like mine, where it's a vast territory with many smaller rural, northern or remote communities, many of them indigenous, um, the ability to access those technologies is different. Uh, and all kinds of, and it's, it's an understandable thing, people, uh, in small rural northern communities in Canada understandably want to have access to the same technology you might have in downtown Toronto or Vancouver. Uh, there's an issue about the technology itself or the cost of getting them uh, a comparable service at a, at, a, at a comparable price. So governments, I think, have a role to play in delivering those basic services in a way that people can access them and certain generations of people, it's a perfect complementary piece to the previous question, uh, perhaps the grandparents of the younger people seeking to access some of that information or services online uh, will want to go to a government office and talk to a public servant that, whose salary they're paying uh, in, in a way that they're able to receive a particular service. And the most, the most obvious example is healthcare. Um, we're thinking of sort of traditional administrative services that have been disrupted by COVID. Uh, 
as I say, airports being the amongst the most obvious ones globally. Um, but access to healthcare, and I'm speaking only because in, in Canada, this is the case, access to high quality, publicly accessible healthcare is of course a huge priority. Uh, the COVID context has made, has put stressors on a, on a healthcare system we've seen globally. Uh, we're not immune from that. It's, it's a reality in our own country. And that to my government is one of the things we worry about most because the public will be unforgiving uh, if uh, governments are, are not able to provide high quality, accessible public health care in the case of my country uh, in, a, in a timely way. And COVID and the average age of people working in these healthcare systems, there's a series of factors uh, that are preoccupying my government and uh, in, in our country, subnational governments, uh, provinces and territories, our partner governments. Uh, that for us is a huge challenge. And I think the professor's right to say, if we don't collectively get those things right, we're not going to see in the next OECD survey those trend lines improving. Uh, I fear that we'll see a deterioration, which is the exact opposite, I think, of what any of us would, would hope for. Thank you, Minister. I think that's an excellent uh, way of capturing, I think, um, the spirit in which we are going about this work. And I think your reference to future surveys is also on point. This is not a one-time effort, but I think there is a commitment uh, to continually uh, being willing to uh, look at, at, at the, the feedback from our citizens and how we can use that to inform our future work. Um, I think we are running uh, out of time here, and but I would like to give everyone kind of a chance, maybe in just a sentence or so, to uh, reflect on um, something uh, you would like uh, us to take away uh, from today as we think about the work going forward. And then I can offer um, a final uh, thought before we uh, end the session. Anyone like to uh, begin with a, a final thought, like in a sentence or so? Uh, thank you very much. I think this last question shows that we have uh, common and shared problems. Uh, and that's another example of the advantages and the opportunities of this type of dialogue that we are sharing is today. We also have problems in the National Health Service, in education with lack of uh, professionals. And uh, when we have the same problems, I think we must find the common solutions or at least uh, shared solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just to add, um, I agree with the previous speakers on the challenges that we collectively face, and I think these surveys can really help us. But just on a, on a personal note, as I was sort of preparing for this, uh, this uh, webinar and thinking about um, my role as a public servant, it was a very significant change for me um, when the State Services Commission in New Zealand changed its name in 2020 to the Public Service Commission. And you know that change in emphasis that now um, public servants needed to focus on New Zealand's individuals, New Zealand organizations, New Zealand communities, they are the focus, they are the motivation for the work of all the public um, sector agencies and all the activities that we do. And I think that switch in focus from state service to public service was a, a really significant one and it makes me proud to be a New Zealand public servant. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Minister Vuong. Dustin, just very briefly, I'm obviously, our country is a big fan of the work that the OECD does. This is a great example of the OECD's commitment to examining and promoting best practices uh, to protect and promote democratic institutions and values. Uh, our country looks forward to learning uh, from this survey, but also learning from partner countries. We look forward to the discussions that governments and civil society uh, around the globe will have as a result of this very significant work that the OECD has undertaken. And I hope like many of my colleagues and my panelists whom I thank for their time this morning and this afternoon, and I hope many of us have a chance uh, to meet in Luxembourg in the middle of November. Um, this is an opportunity for all of us to examine uh, in a in a in a self-critical way, as we must do in these in these contexts, uh, but also in a, in a way that we can learn from each other uh, and commit ourselves to improving 
uh, public trust in democratic institutions. It's, it's essential for the future of, of the country, certainly that I represent and the partner countries. Um, but it's a privilege for me to have had a few minutes, Dustin, with you this morning uh, from the East Coast of Canada. I thank you very much for the invitation and I thank the OECD for this terrific work and look forward to participating, I hope, in future uh, elaborations of this ongoing uh, challenge that we all face. Thank you. You all have made my job very easy. And in terms of wrapping this up and I think uh, kind of bringing out the core um, uh, items we wanted uh, to be able to reflect on in this moment and uh, use to really chart the course going forward. So I'd really like to thank uh, First Prime Minister uh, Bettel and Secretary General Corman and the ministers and ambassadors who joined us today as speakers uh, for this really fascinating panel on a timely and critically important topic. Uh, let me also thank Elsa, who I see, and her team for really making all this possible and the tireless work that they really have put into not just the trust survey, but also um, the work they are doing uh, to prepare for the ministerial meeting that uh, Minister LeBlanc and others have referred to uh, taking place in Luxembourg on building trust and reinforcing democracy. And I look forward to countries continuing to build momentum on this armed with the actionable insights, I think that we are getting from this trust survey. So we will work collectively to deliver progress on this uh, for all. Um, and uh, really it's at the heart of OECD's mandate and even more critical today in a complex global environment where uh, uh, our shared values of transparency, trust, and democracy count more than ever before. So I do look forward to seeing um, many of you at the Global Forum on Building Trust and Reinforcing Democracy in Luxembourg, uh, November 17th. And uh, wanna thank everyone again for making time uh, this morning, this afternoon, and this evening, wherever you might be um, on uh, these critical um, issues. So uh, much appreciated and um, to be continued. Thanks everyone.